Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can everyone hear my voice? Can. Okay. Uh, let's let's start our session. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning. I bid to the speaker and all participants. So, before we begin our session, let's start with the recitation of Umur Kitab Al Fatihah. So, dear all participants, please fill in the Google form for the start point via the link provided. So, without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker for today, Dr. Uzair, to start the session. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good morning. Uh, semua orang boleh dengar ke? Boleh, Doctor. Boleh, eh? It's clear because I'm not wearing any earphone or headphone so uh, sebab malas lah ada wire-wire and stuff so I'll just speaking through the microphone uh, from the laptop okay I'm trying to share my screen from my browser, but if I would it, I'll try the other browser. Can you see this slide? Can, Doctor. Boleh nampak, eh? Boleh. Okay, so for those who are just came in, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh again and very good morning. Selamat Hari Raya as well. 
uh, for this session, um, I already say it's just a sharing because, like, uh, I believe some of my colleagues as well uh, attend this session. I noticed I did the equal as well. Um, it just for me it's just a sharing session. Uh, it was a slide that I retrieved during my academic session. I believe some of the slides are a bit obsolete and maybe need some updates and I'm sure that you guys already know better than me because I've been leaving the medical school almost a year now, almost a year I guess. And I'm sure enough that you guys know these particular things even better than me, I suppose, because you are currently in the school and you see patients like, every day and you meet our beloved lecturers every day and you have maybe recently seen the case or discussed a uh, few cases pertaining to this topic. So like I said earlier, uh, I try my best to present the, the, the topic, but I'm sure you guys have a lot more better knowledge than I am, I suppose. So inshallah, we try to go slide by slide. I actually have a, a bit long of slide, this long of slide because when uh, company the the person in charge tell me that i have to present the on approach of respiratory disease in children so we have quite few but i i i suppose uh belajar mana yang we seen lah and the important one okay uh, let's begin so first of all respiratory respiratory disorder so Respiratory disorder itself is the second leading cause of uh, emergency visit in children. So the first, the first, it's it's actually different from country by country. So in developed country, um, most of them come because of injury and poisoning. Like the less developed country and developing country, most uh, most complaint came for like acute gastroenteritis. AG and then the respiratory disorder but uh, you have to take account that the respiratory disorder is the most common cause of death in child less than 60 months 60 months because uh, especially in developing and developed country because like this country AG is and food poisoning like cholera is no longer prevalent so kids are not like a little adult, so we have to take account that they are anatomical and physiological in respiratory mechanism are a bit different. So it makes them more vulnerable to any changes or disease in particular. So these are few differences between child and adult from the nose, vocal cord, quick cord, airway diameter, tracheal rings and slip muscle. Even in the airway diameter, it's just 4 millimeter versus 20 millimeter in adult. So any inflammation of the airway, it will it will cause a much more uh, severity in the breathing uh, mechanism. For example, because you see here that the airway diameter is just 4 mm, and the infl if some inflammation is going on. For example, if it's like only one mm is becomes swollen and it's really affecting the airway diameter, like twenty five percent of them is blocked rather than in adult. So that's why in respiratory disorder for uh, in child, the child may uh, may worsening in a uh, very fast. So the smooth muscle in children is also uh much more reactive and it's much more sensitive so any inflammation or any infection the smooth muscle will easily become spasm and uh and it will uh, contract more rigorously and uh, it make patient deteriorate easily so there's also different between not just the airway and the thorax of the children itself 
So for example, the horizontal ribs and the flatter diaphragms, uh, they actually require more and more energy for them to exercise uh, breathing. Means uh, less energy is required for a, an adult to uh, breathing, but more uh, energy for a child to to breathe because they have larger abdominal organ. The heart takes more because the heart's relatively larger in the size of their thoracic cavity, and their accessory muscle is uh, accessory muscle is not well developed. So they need more uh, energy exercise to to breathe. So if there is some uh, impairment of their breathing or uh, infection or like uh, inflammation going on on their lung field, so their accessory, their auxiliary power to breathe is not really reliable as, as an adult. So airway urgency can quickly progress to airway emergency. For example, like one child came with just asthma and it was the, the parents was not really told about the asthma action plan. So they, they did not give any path or they did not give any uh, MDI prior to attend to the emergency. They just uh, wait some time and they see the child like deteriorates and then they didn't give any MDI because they didn't they didn't know that they should be doing that. So in matter of time, the child can easily progress, uh, become, it's becoming uh, an emergency. So like always we have been preaching for so long, which is the ABCDE, airway breathing circulation, disability and exposure. So but this is very important for especially the uh, medical student and uh, very important when you came across a question. So you, you came across a question and uh, as well during the examination, sometimes we stumble upon airway breathing circulation disability exposure. We always chanting that uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to set up or I would like to do A, B, C, D, E, but we did not actually verse enough what A, B, C, D, E means. So this is just some few slides and I'm not planning to go uh, really detail on this because uh, you can read this later on. Okay, so we going up through a uh, few this, but I suppose if uh, the clinical students, uh, for example, the third year student, I, I believe you have gone through this through your uh, pediatric seminar. This is basically the same topic that we just recap again uh, because it's very important. And um, you can see these cases a, a, a bit, lah, a lot of these cases came up in the exam as well and uh, in the in the ward. So this is like a must know case now. Okay, so first of all, uh, we when we have a respiratory cases, we have to differentiate whether this is an upper airway disease or a lower airway disease. So an upper airway disease, basically it's, it's uh, divided from the nose, from, uh, from the nose until the larynx. And lower than the larynx is like, is a lower airway disease. So the common upper airway disease are crook, foreign body, uh, foreign body, uh, aspirated, uh, epiglottitis, uh, tra bacterial trachitis. Uh, and how you can differ from upper airway or lower airway is from the noise itself. So if you heard the noise uh, during the breathing, it's during inspiration, it's most likely it's proximal to the thoracic inlet. So, but, uh, okay, so now you know, okay, so the noise came from inspiration. Now, it's important as well for you to, to differentiate whether this is nose, pharynx, or distal to the larynx. So, if the patient awake and crying, if it's improved by crying, so it's most likely the, the, 
the blockage or the inflammation or disease is located at the nose or pharynx area. If the crying, uh, if the patient cry and it deteriorates, it means it's um, distal to the larynx. So some of the common lower lower airway disease is like asthma, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and foreign body. Like if the foreign body pass through the larynx, so it becomes foreign body aspiration. So foreign body can be upper airway and lower airway. It depends where the the foreign body gets stuck. So so it can be in the trachea or it can be in the bronchi or it can be in the bronchioles and the peripheral airways. So we go through to the upper airway disease first. So we have croup. So croup is basically a viral infection. It usually caused by the parainfluenza virus and it can be caused by uh, respiratory syncytial virus as well. It occur most commonly among age six months to three years old. It's more prevalent in, you know, in the, in, in foreign country, it can be in the four season country, it can be prevalent in fall and spring. But in Malaysia, uh, it coincidentally occurred during that rainy season where people, most of them are uh, stay indoors. And when you stay indoors and with our country high humidity, so the virus can be easily transmitted through the uh, through the water droplets. So that's why it's more prevalent during the rainy season, especially when the child is being sent to institutional like nursery home, some nursery home, or like when they are shared care between like some cousin, some some nephew that are living together. So it's more prevalent during the rainy season. Uh, so it's basically a clinical diagnosis, but you can uh, you can do X-ray where you can see the narrowing of the airway lumen, which is called a steeple sign. Uh, severe cases where if the the airway become very very inflamed, it can cause obstruction to the airway. So, like I said earlier, croup is basically a clinical diagnosis where it is a URTI, upper respiratory tract infection with combination of rhinorrhea, pharyngitis, mild cough, and low-grade fever. So with those kind of uh, initially symptom, initial symptom that, you know, like coryza-like symptom, it can develop into, and then the de patient develop into a barking cough. So this barking cough occur because the inflammation the, the uh, inflammation that gone through their larynx and their upper airway tract that making the cough is not from the lung, it's from their uh, vocal cord and larynx. So it caused the barking cough, the characteristic of barking cough. So uh, if there is hoarseness of voice, it shows that the vocal cord has been uh, affected. And inspiratory stridor means that uh, the inflammation, the wall of the airway has become thickened, making like uh, causing the stride, because it causing uh, this the patient to have inspiratory stridor. Uh, yeah, but but the good thing about croup, it's it can uh, without if it's not really serious enough. It can be treated symptomatically, and it usually resolves uh, within a week. However, uh, because uh, croup is like uh, can easily transmitted through water droplet, so it's e it's better for the child to be isolated because it's easily transmitted or infecting other child as well. So when you have croup, so you have to assess the severity itself. So it have mild, moderate to severe. So like mild, you only have stridor during assignment. Like when the child plays, only then the stridor there. Or at rest with recession, or severe at rest with mild recession and decreased air entry. And that's why it's very important for you to examine the patient thoroughly because it, 
it will differentiate whether this is a moderate to severe because in severe there were severe and moderate you still have recession but you have to differentiate whether there is decrease and entry or not so some of the cases of group it's not require any hospitalization for example just mild group you can treat at home so but some if the patient is less than six months have poor oral intake or family live far from hospital you need to hospitalize them some hospital if you came more than 12 am you need to be admitted because because for logistic purposes as well because uh, in our country for example if you're in hda some patient came all the way from uh Chirating, from some came from a current it's it's better for them to be admitted first and observed in the ward rather than you discharge them. The principle of the treatment, basically, we only wanted to relieve the obstruct, obstructive symptom. So you can nebulize them with Buddhist night or in severe cases, you can give uh, uh, adrenaline, uh, nebul adrenaline nebulizer. And you have to monitor the patient blood pressure and also pulse rate, as well as the oxygen saturation. So we go next to epiglottitis. So uh, why epiglottitis is, uh, you need to know epiglottitis, although rarely we see the epiglottitis cases. If you seen one, you know, it's going to be like in the headlines of newspaper because epiglottitis is not very common due to most of our community now have been vaccinated with hemophilus influenza B. But, you know, because of the, you know, like currently there are so many parents out there who are trying to be naturopathy and they didn't want to vaccine their child might see in one case, but epiglottitis itself is a true medical emergency. So it's patient will deter deteriorate very rapidly. And because it's at the epiglottitis, it, it, it is where your the function of epi, uh, epiglossal, uh, the glossal itself is to close the airway when you when you're having your meal. So when the vocal cord or the glo uh, the epiglossal is inflamed, so it will uh, quickly obstruct your airway. That's why it's actually a true medical emergency. So if you are about to make a X-ray, you will see a thumb sign. But I think, uh, but it's good to know because this kind of question can be asked in the in the MCQ question or OBE question, although you rarely seen one in the world. So there are a few things that are special about epiglottitis. Because of the sudden onset of uh, blockage of the airway, so the child will have several uh, special clinical features. For example, they can be sitting in tripod position holding mouth open with tongue pro protruding because they wanted to release their airway blockage. So, first cry with inspiratory stridor. So, they try as, as uh, they try to compensate the airway obstruction by doing this because it is so severe that this clinical manifestation uh, occurs. So the principle of management of epiglottitis, basically, you have to maintain to pattern the airflow and oxygenation. But uh, it been it's been a hard choice as well because uh, when you try to incubate, when you try to uh, try to do something to the patient, because you do it on the already inflamed airway. So intubation can be very difficult. So like if you try to do uh, endotracheal intubation, it could, be, it could be a failure because you cannot pass through the vocal cord. The vocal cord is 
too obstructed, too inflamed, and you might be penetrate the vocal cord and become vocal cord injury, and the patient may become uh, mute or becoming uh, kind of uh, unable to talk later on. So you might have to do tracheostomy and pass through the vocal cord instead rather than doing ETT. So the key point here is very important for you to vaccinate your child rather than see your child uh, intubated or slit through the throat for tracheostomy. So next is to treat the disease itself. So uh, antibiotic uh, of choice for uh, hemophilus influenza, usually we use uh, cephalosporin group, uh, which is this one is cefuroxib, uh, but it always you can always uh, check uh, whether cefuroxib is helping or not, and you can uh, taper with the taper with the uh, daily with the blood CNS because like this uh, like these cases uh, you have to do septic workout. Usually, patient become septic looking, so you have to do blood CNS and uh, blood CNS, and you have to see whether there is degree of resistance to it, uh, second generation uh, cephalosporin because currently there is wide usage of uh, antibiotics. So some bacteria becoming mutated and develop resistant towards uh, the common antibiotic that they usually get uh, given. So you have also to treat the close contact because uh, as I said earlier, this is like a fatal disease. So before someone you know, succumb into a totally obstructed airway, you should treat them with rifampicin as well. So prevention with HIV vaccination is very important. Now we go to aspirated foreign body. So it's very common, one to three years old child where they are love to put something into their mouth. It can be a coin, it can be beads, it can be a pill, it can be anything. So, and you have to be aware of that. So, you have to assess whether it is a complete obstruction or it's a partial obstruction. Usually, if it's small object, it usually causes partial obstruction to the left bronchus because the left bronchus is more horizontal. Uh, so that the object easily lodged uh, to the airway. Okay. So what you can do is you have to give them uh, oxygen and you have to make them uh, prepare an intubation equipment if they come to emergency. So what you need to do is, for example, your ABC, your ABC, and then you have to comfort the child, give their oxygen. Uh, you do not really have to intubate the patient, but you have to monitor the oxygen saturation. Okay? Uh, because some it could be just a partial obstruction, but a partial obstruction with a patient that have several comor comorbidities, for example, asthma or like patient allergic to something, those uh, foreign object, foreign body can aggravate the allergic reaction and cause uh, the total airway blockage. So from the partial obstruction from a foreign body and it causes inflammation, both of the airway can be obstructed. So patient can be like gone, now, become complete obstruction. So what if it's a complete obstruction? So if it's a complete obstruction, you have, you got to remove by using your basic life support. Yeah, you have to use your uh, your maneuver and you have to check whether the patient is uh, still have pulse or not. So at that time, it's very crucial whether you have to do CPR before sending the patient to, to, the, to the emergency and for them to be scoped. To remove the foreign body. So these are the several several differential diagnoses that can cause stridor. Yeah.
For example, a suprachorotic area, you can have anaphylactic reaction, epiglottitis, you can have laryngomalacia, congenital malformation, or even a tumor on the oral cavity or on the pharynx because those tumor, they are mimicking, they are making an obstruction. So that cause uh, stridor. So as well uh, at, at the glottic and subglottic area, you have you can have tracheomalacia. So you can have actually both laryngotracheomalacia, subglottic stenosis, bacterial tracheitis, foreign body in the area of vocal cord paralysis, uh, or you can have intrathoracic area, which expiratory stridor, or and or and or, or with easing. For example, infection, foreign body. Like I said earlier, for a body that cause uh, an allergic reaction, anaphylaxis reaction that cause a spasm of the uh, peripheral airway, and it can cause wheezing on top of the stridor that the patient has. So now we go to the lower airway disease. So when you go to lower airway disease, like I said in earlier, that why does the child easily become deteriorates? compared to the adults, this is explained by the Puzzle's law. Puzzle's law defines that if a radius is half, the resistance increased by 16, 16 times. So it means if uh, an, an area of a child uh, is 4 millimeter and some inflammation of only 2 millimeter, it can by 2 millimeter, it causes the resistance for the airway to enter the uh, for the air to enter the airway increased by 16 times so it makes that's that's uh, explain why uh, the child easily become deteriorated so yeah this is the point point law so now we go to asthma uh, this is very common topic where you you can see a lot of cases in the world, right? There is in and out asthma. This is must know cases for the exam, for the end of block examination. And also for if there is a final year, okay? Uh, it's also important for final professional because uh, in final professional examination, there would be some cases from the world as well. So if you're lucky enough, so you can you you might get a, an acute cases rather than a chronic cases. So you can have asthma during your professional exam. So asthma basically a chronic airway inflammation leading to increased airway responsiveness that leads to airflow obstruction. The most common uh, the most common question that like to be asked for asthma. Mm, the examiner likes to ask what is the type of hypersensitivity for asthma. So asthma is type 1 hypersensitivity. It's IgE-mediated hypersensitivity. So you you need to well versed about the hypersensitivity. So whenever you say hypersensitive type 1, so the examiner started to, you know, like start asking you what is type 2, type 3, and type 4. So you... Although it's a BMS topic, but you have you need to really know a little bit, I guess, about the hypersensitivity that one, that two, that three, and that four. So usually, uh, asthma is uh, night or early in the morning. It's reversible, unlike COPD. Most of COPD did not reverse very well. It can be reversible or reduced in severity, but patient did not become a totally normal like he previously. So it's different from asthma and COPD. Now that is a very favorite question if you're in medical. You, you did it, you will not be asked one in pediatric, but to compare asthma and COPD, comparison between asthma and COPD, that is favorite question in medical. So PEFR show evidence of 50% improvement in response to bronchodilator. So this is why also that by definition as well, you have to know that in the ward, usually we get patient peak uh, PEFR or airflow meter. So 
patient will uh, record themselves their improvement after we give them treatment. So before and after to show the improvement of the treatment. So basically from the history, you have to ask symptoms like intermittent dry cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and pattern of the symptom. Uh, you got to really ask the patient what triggers and precipitating factors because uh, because it will actually change the management. For example, some child, some children, they they really really triggered by smokes, especially cigarette smokes. So it's very important that you have to stop the triggering or the precipitating factors rather than keep pop up or keep step up the medication. It's no use you give patient Montelukas, we have so many things, but at the end, it just actually, the triggering factor or the precipitating factor, you did not take away from them. So patient will not get better. So it's very important for the parents as well to recognize what is actually trigger their children. So some of the risk factor. So the risk factor is actually important when you wanted to uh, establish the diagnosis, especially when the child is less than five years old. So we don't actually easily diagnose patient less than five years old with asthma because their AWA is very reactive. So anything can mimic like asthma, but like the letter I show you, maybe you've already seen the one in uh, pediatric protocol, the probability of asthma. So how does the patient respond to the treatment? So the hospital admission, when was the last hospital admission? This is also important in your history taking because mm, when you take the history, the examiner will like ask you, oh, this is what kind of the control this patient have on us? Is this a well control, is it poor control or uh, not, not well control? So it's very important for you to ask how many exacerbations, what was the previous uh, admission was like? So usually the patient have been admitted to ICU. There is a chance. There is always a chance for like this patient is going to be in the PICU again and again. So it's very important. So whenever this patient who have been in the ICU and they come you they come into the ED, so you might want it to to you know notify the PICU team that we might need a bed. Okay. So and the impact on the lifestyle as well. So how many days does this patient unable to school and uh, what the activity did the patient cannot do in the school? Uh, what about the physical education in the school? But you know, it's rather hard this time, you know, everything online. So yeah, most students, most patients did not go to school because they just did not wake up in the morning to open up their laptops and attend the class, or they even forget to fill up the Google Classroom attendance. So general examination, I think this is, this is what you see, what you've, I, I guess what you've been doing and what you've always searching for when you examine patients who are having asthma. So sign of chronic illnesses, you can have Harrison's Halkins, hyperinflated chest, eczema or dry skin or hypertrophic turbinate, which means that this patient is uh, having asthma due to uncontrolled atopy which is the uh, hypertrophic turbinate suggests that they actually have allergic rhinosinusitis. Eczema means they are actually have allergic dermatitis. It means that the triggering factor or the uh, sensitivity to its atopy is not well controlled enough rather than it just on their lungs, but right? it's actually a systemic illness that have not been controlled very well. So this is all the thing that you have to look for chest wall deformity on percussion they will be hyper resonant because the chest is hyper inflated due to uh, airway obstruction that unable for the uh, for the airway to be released uh, to the surrounding 
on auscultation, you can see a reduced breath sound, prolonged expiratory phase, and a general expiratory bronchi. If you heard a silent chest, it means it's already become life threatening. Okay, this is uh, the probability of asthma. You've seen this in your fix protocol, and I took this from fix protocol as well. So basically, this is important when your patient is less than five years old. So when the patient is less than five years old, you cannot ask so much question. So you cannot really know the, the improvement through the PEFR. So this is, you score them by the probability. You have low, moderate, and high. So high probability means it's, only, it's just suggestive that your diagnosis of uh, asthma is most likely correct. So it's just that. Okay, rather than you just put episodic wheezing or uh, virus upper, virus induced wheeze, okay, you can put asthma because how is that important? If you if you diagnose patient with asthma and episodic wheeze, because it's it's important in the sorts of in the sense of uh, the management wise, because if it's just episodic wheeze. It's just episodic. One is just episodic. Two, you wouldn't you wouldn't care to explain about the asthma action plan because it's just episodic and it just usually it's just a viral induced that cause the patient have to be the patient currently having shortness of breath and wheezing. But if you if you already diagnose this with asthma. The view of the disease itself will be different. The parents will be alert that there is something that the patient is might allergic on, and there's some triggering factor that they should have uh, avoid. Okay, and they will be given like uh, PAP or like MDI so they can do something before they brought their patient to the emergency department. So this is the level of control of asthma. We have the well control, partly control and uncontrolled. So basically, this is very important for you to remember, especially in the uh, examination, long case or short, long case especially, for you to, okay, your diagnosis will be, this is uncontrolled, previously uncontrolled asthma, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma secondary to upper respiratory tract infection, previously uncontrolled bronchial asthma, ataupun well controlled, ataupun partly controlled. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is medication. Mm. I think for the treatment, it's always good to know, but knowing the medication is already good enough. I, myself, I do not remember everything you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. But you can actually know, okay, some of the medication that are that are important, uh, like uh, the reliever, you have to remember like reliever, some of the ICS, like fruticasone and the LPRA. Okay, and then from there, you can step up, step up. Lah. And the step up is, I, actually you have to remember from step one, step two, step two, yeah, because Okay, if the 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 doctor say kan, macam okay, you dah bagi step two tapi patient tak okay pun, uh, answer dia senang je lah macam okay, kita increase the dose, double the dose ataupun kita tambah ubat lain. And then you consider uh, like like I said earlier, you have to check lah whether you bagi dia MDI ni, method dose inhaler ni, is it properly properly used or not? So how about the uh, the aero chamber? If it if it's the aero chamber is uh, wash thoroughly, uh, clean thoroughly, dry thoroughly, and the technique of the use of MDI and stuff. And another one is whether there are triggering factors, triggering factors or the predisposing factors is taken away or not from them. Otherwise, you just remember step one, step two, and then load. Upper, continue, uh, double the dose, and then you can add uh, LPRA and increase the frequency. So double the dose or and uh, increase the frequency. 
So this is a management of chronic asthma in children more than six years old. Um, basically, this is how you classify the patient. So whether this is mild persistent ataupun moderate persistent, severe persistent. So yang tadi tu we have uh, whether it's partly control, well control ataupun uncontrolled. This one is how uh, whether whether the asthma is um, berterusan ke, tak berterusan ke macam tu. Okay, this is basically uh, different a bit. Uh, the difference is uh, between six years old and older and also five years old and older. Thing is, young six years old and older, they have uh, long action, long acting beta agonist and they have medium dose. Basically, it's just, it's the dose. Okay, uh, otherwise, I think the medication is very kurang sama and this one as well, the six years and older, you can add on the oral corticosteroid. But usually for the child less than five years old, we don't go, we don't give uh, low dose oral corticosteroid for long term. It's just during the exacerbation, yes, we give them uh, like uh, hydrocort or penicillin. But then it's only up until their exacerbation is over and then we don't continue. But for example, like this patient which have not been controlled enough with step 4, so on the step 5, we have to add some uh, oral corticosteroid. So when the patient come with severe acute exacerbation of asthma, this is also important in the sense of examination. So when the, this patient come in the ED, what is the grade of the exacerbation? Is it mild, moderate, severe, or flat? So, kena korek lah dari, dari patient or dari the, the parents. How was during the admission? Because when you see patient at the ward, usually they have been nebulized, they have been treated, they have been given several doses of antibiotic, they're really well, they run, run, jalan, jalan, semua. So, you see them as like, Okay, that's it. Then he maybe then a discharge. But then, how was actually when he presented to the world? So it's very important in the sense of it's important for you to document. So next time when they came, or you data, oh, this patient follow data, we must survey or life threatening. So your asthma action plan have to be uh, to be told very thoroughly to the patient. So yeah, me I guess. Uh, I think macam you have to, banyak kan dia macam ni kan, so macam nak tak nak memang you have to hafal lah. Tapi the important thing about uh, this acute asthma exacerbation, if there is a component that falls into severe, you have to follow the severe. Kita bukan ikut majority lah macam contoh uh, majority dekat mild, ada satu je dekat moderate, oh dia masih mild. So it's not work like that. What you need to do is kalau ada yang moderate, so actually patient dah moderate lah. Uh, tapi there is like you have to really macam macam kena 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 fikir jugalah contohnya macam uh, contoh patient ada autism spectrum ASD. So when the patient come, memang patient tak boleh cakap sebab dia ada ASD. So yang tu you you tak adalah dia terus jadi life threatening because they unable to speak. Okay. So you have to tell it clinically. Okay, uh, contoh macam PEFR dia tak boleh buat sebab dia tak tahu nak buat macam mana. Especially less than five years old lah. Less than five years old tak boleh buat PEFR. So it does not force into terus unable to go. Terus life threatening. So you have to consider yang lain-lain juga lah. Macam pericardia, sublimation, school respiratory effort. Whether this is life threatening or severe type of asthma. Okay. So basically, in the, uh, this one is important as well because uh, this one usually will be asked like, in your acute management. So always explain your, so how do you manage this management? 
uh, management of this patient, I will divide the management management of this. I will manage this patient uh, into two division, which is uh, acutely and um, for long term management. So currently, for the current treatment, apa apa apa, you have the treatment, and for the long term management, apa dia? Uh, the long term management is basically your MDI tadi tu lah. Yang this one is just for your acute. Okay, so that's why it's very important yang awal-awal ni my the mild, the mild severity ni. Because when patient have asthma at home, you can actually treat them selama satu jam ni, a buffer time between one hour until they can into the emergency department. So the parents actually can give some uh, MDI because usually they only have their salbutamol at home. So they have to time their children to take 8 to 12 puff and then every 20 minutes and then they, they observe. If they think that by 8 to 12 puff, the patient is already improved and it's not necessarily for them to be treated at the hospital. Okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of parents I think they become panic when the patient is having asthma. They don't even give the patient any MDI. They straight away bring them to, to the emergency department. So kena tunggu lama and then complain lah itu ini kan. So actually they have to be, they can, the patient should know, the parents should know that they should give MDI first. Uh, tapi janganlah bagi MDI lepas tu, dah lepas 60 minit and then masih tak okay tapi biar je lagi bagi MDI sampai esok. So macam it's not like that, but at least they can do something at home. So, and then we can start give oral prednisolone. So yang ni you review after 20 minutes where they wanted to discharge treatment and asthma action plan. Uh, this is what I'm saying, you can start short course of oral steroid for three to five days uh, and re regular bronchodilators is to four to six hours. And then you can give them as per needed lah. And you need to see them actually for like two weeks or four weeks uh, in the in the pits clinic. Otherwise, kalau tak okay, this you follow lah the 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 algorithm until you have to give IV sabutamol. But I tell you, if you wanted to give a uh, terbutalin ke adrenaline, uh, you need to give. But so you have to inform ICU first uh, before you not be able to adrenaline because it's required cardiac monitoring. So you 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 cannot like give patient the cat ED not be able straight away subcutaneous subcutaneous because patient will be uh, will be you know like patient can have uh, cardiac abnormality lah. Uh, the arrhythmia so it, it required to be uh, at least you already informed the PICU team or the PITS team uh, especially especially if you're in ED like we've already give uh, patient that okay we get this abutamol and we're going to be subcute tributally so um, the PICU need to be informed so they have they prepare uh, cardiac monitoring so IV magnesium sulfate it helps in the sense of it relax the smooth muscle and it's actually prepared the patient for mechanical intubation. So you remember that bronchial asthma is when the airway is very, very reactive. It's spasm, it's uncontrolled. So intubate them would be very, very difficult and challenging. So that's why we give IV magnesium something to relax them, to help that they breathe better, but it's actually help them if they require an intubation so it's not become a very difficult uh, intubation. So some investigation that are needed, like uh, pulse oximetry, this is backside PFR for you to see whether the improvement of your, uh, your improvement of your treatment. You can do spirometry, but in small child, Spirometry would be very difficult because you have to follow the command whether you have to expire, full expire, full inspired, and so on and so forth. So it's going to be very difficult. A full blood count or blood CNS it can be done. 
uh, full blood count especially, you can look for lucosinophilia and leukocytosis or if the patient can be very septic looking, you can go for uh, blood culture and sensitivity. ABG is like the if the patient is uh, not very well under the room air, which, which you have to top up with them with a high flow uh, oxygen mask or giving them like uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation. So you might need to look on the ABG whether there is some changes like uh, respiratory acidosis and to see whether the CO2 has been washed out or not. So you might be you might be surprised if the uh, see if the SpO2 is ninety-five uh, percent, but sometimes we still do ABG because we would like to see the CO2 level. Uh, the SpO2 can be very comforting, ninety-five, ninety-seven, but sometimes the CO2 is not being washed out, so patients still can have respiratory acidosis. You can do skin prick test. This is not available in the government hospital. But if you go to like Glen Eagles, like Columbia, Asia, they have this kind of test where they take some of your blood and they test and they test to some of the allergens and see if there is some uh, allergic reaction. So this is in the sense that if you did not know what triggers the child, Kita tak tahulah kucing ke, ikan ke, sayur ke, sabun ke, apa-apalah. So, they test you with those things and they will see lah what actually triggers you. Uh, but I think we don't offer this lah in the government setting. And this is why um, if you look on the pediatric protocol pre previously, uh, we have the arrow allergen sensitivity but that criteria is no longer there because it's not uh, effective and efficient to do aeroallergen and to detect allergen in patients who have asthma. So basically, we just uh, advise them to actually prevent any things that empirically can cause or trigger asthma. So chest x-ray can be found or can be ordered. As usually, it's a normal, but Asthma always came with, you know, those patients who have asthma, they don't just like exacerbate it without any reason. They usually have they usually have something that exacerbate them. Usually pneumonia, urti, or even lung collapse or anything inside the lung. So yeah, you should actually find out what is it and you should treat the cause of exacerbation rather than putting the asthma on control alone. So patient education and prevention, you should explain to the patient the nature of the disease. Some parents, they think that asthma is like when you have upper respiratory tract infection then, you know, with some time, some medication, the disease goes away. So unlike asthma, it's a chronic disease. It's, it's only can be controlled, but it cannot be curable. Like in diabetes, it's like hypertension. This nature of the disease should be explained to the patient, to the parents and to the patient. Why? Because, um, because some patients with asthma, they can be like, they don't have any attack right for several months and years. So they think that, oh, I think I've been cured by asthma. So maybe I can try peanuts and have cats. So, and the moment they try those things, they actually end up with anaphylactic shock, anaphylaxis. So it's very important that they shouldn't because this disease is not curable, it's still there. So if you're allergic to peanut and it causes you to have asthma, don't try peanut even when you're 40 years old okay, because you can, you know, only God, only God knows where you can have anaphylactic shock. Okay? Parents should be able to recognize the sign and symptom of asthma. Both patient and parents should know about the medication prescribed, especially the MDI. Because when we prescribe patients with MDI, we usually 
for step two, patient will have Sabutamol and also Buddhist night or Pritikasan. So it's very important that that's why it's usually colored for that. So the Sabutamol is the blue one, the, the Buddhist night is the brown one. So it's very important for at least they know what color and when they should wear it, use it. Okay, uh, using especially when they exacerbated because they sometimes mess up, they use a wrong MDI for a wrong purpose. So their asthma is not well controlled and it's not helpful. So a written asthma plan should be given. So they have to have asthma action plan. What to do if they have asthma and how to resuscitate. The parents have to be always thought about how to resuscitate if the patient collapse or if the patient do not put anything on the mouth, how to, use, to do CPR and so and so forth. Because some patients, sometimes some parents, they didn't know and we did not tell them. It's not, that's, that's why we have to tell them. And then they should put on the asthma diary as well. The asthma diary in the sense of it's make it easier for us to do um, the history taking. So we know that this patient is actually well controlled and controlled. Okay. Um, Try to not have contact with people with any upper respiratory infection. And like I said earlier, prevent from uh, contacting dust, laundering, with bedding, and upper letak la kape, tak payah de kape. Okay, yang banyak banyak. Abu ni prevent prevent from asthmatic patients. Okay, I think we have two topics. A few much almost just a two jam uh, so this is bronchiolitis. Mm, it's it's common in the ward, especially patients with what uh, younger than one year old. It's caused by respiratory syncytial virus and rhinovirus. Uh, history that you required to know lah, length of the illness of the fever. Uh, taking any medication, other asthma, but it's important because uh, usually it's less than one year old. So asthma, allergy, asthma is not likely, la, unlikely for you to for you to diagnose. But sometimes the patient already develop into allergy, and you have to know the feeding of the patient. Why it's important because it's. It's the it's will determine whether you want to treat this as inpatient or outpatient. Okay, for uh, you have to. It's like a basic thing. You have to rule out the sign and symptom, the acute respiratory distress. This is all the the similar thing. What you look in asthma, what you look in pneumonia, you have to able to uh, evaluate in bronchiolitis. Thing is, um, the bron the special features for the bronchiolitis is uh, it's usually less than one year old, and it does not have really high grade fever because it's a viral infection. Okay, the management um, you can assess. You have to assess and maintain the airway. You have to decide for home or hospital management. Like I said earlier, septic workout is not always necessary because most. Most of the patient is one year less than one year old. So for you to do septic workout, it's usually it's becoming a struggle. Okay. That if I did the patient has just mild SOB and you try to withdraw blood and whatsoever, it's making life more complicated. So unless when you when you ascultate the patient, it's not just wheezing. There's some crepitation and it caught it, and some crepitation that might suggest it's actually on top of they have bronchiolitis, they also have pneumonia. So in that sense, yeah, septic workout is necessary. But if it's just a common normal bronchiolitis, uh, septic workout is not really an option. So you can nebulize patient with saline solution, saline, the normal saline. So you put them in the nebulizing machine, nebulize them. It helps to clear up the mucus and 
uh, to so, so that the mucus will be slightly uh, thin and easily been swallowed again. And you can all also use the sabu to more. Okay, uh, beta two agonists uh, rather than uh, corticosteroids. So corticosteroid inhale, inhale corticosteroid like budesonide or Sutikasum is not really much show much improvement. Okay. Uh, and lastly, we we have choice, we always have choice of monoclonal antibodies, which is a mono, monoclonal antibody against the protein of uh, RSV, but it costs few thousands and bronchiolitis has very low mortality, it's just less than 1% mortality and it's usually uh, healed within, cured within one to two weeks. So yeah, there is a choice, but it depends. Okay. So this is for hospital management and for the management itself, whether you want to decide for home management or hospital management. So it depends. For example, if you have patient with age less than three months, so yeah, regardless of how the patient looks like or whether the patient, uh, the severity of the recession or whether it's toxic looking or not toxic looking, at least you have to be, you have to admit the patient for close observation. Okay, like maybe like for close to 24 hours, if you think that the patient does not require any further intervention, you can discharge the patient. So several other things that you have to look into is like whether the patient is toxic looking, any chest recession, central sinuses, waste, palpitation or on the auscultation, feeding, apnea, oxygen saturation or intubation in high risk group. So like I said earlier, if the feeding becomes very difficult, you can uh, Basically, this is just rule of thumb. Whether if any disease for pits, if difficult feeding, feeding for difficult, you have difficulty in feeding. So I think it should be admitted for hospital management. So we go to the last topic, which is pneumonia. It's pneumonia is basically it's infection of lower respiratory tract. It directly involves the airway in its parent chyma. Unlike the other disease, uh, like uh, asthma and uh, epiglottitis and the upper airway, it's just only the airway alone without uh, changing or any affecting towards the parent chyma of the lung field. So yeah, that I said earlier, although in developed country and developing country, pneumonia is the leading cause of death. Uh, but in malnutrition country, uh, in in less than or poor country, AGE is still uh, the most common cause of death. But yeah, despite of those cases, even mortality for childhood pneumonia in malnutrition poverty is always high as well. There's few risk factors for a patient to develop pneumonia. Low birth weight, lack of breastfeeding, failure to complete immunization, okay? presence of cough or sick contact at home, overcrowding and tobacco smoke. Tobacco smoke. Uh, it's important for us because currently the government already uh, set up a new schedule for the pneumococcal in, uh, immunization. So, so next time if you see patient in the ward, you can actually ask whether they are vaccinated for pneumococcal as well. This is very important. It's not just preventing pneumonia, but it's also able to uh, able to uh, prevent any streptococcal non-respiratory uh, causes disease. For example, like uh, rheumatic valvular heart disease and uh, like glomerulonephritis. 
So this is all streptococcal cause disease. So if you are in, uh, vaccinated uh, with pneumococcal vaccine, so it, it's less likely for you get, to get pneumonia as well uh, as with the related disease such as the RBHD and also bromeliral uh, nephritis. So the pathophysiology, I guess this is, uh, yeah, it's good to know, but it's, it's an infection, yeah. Okay, classification, it can be classified into anatomical, etiology, or how is it required. It can be lobar pneumonia, bronchopneumonia, or interstitial pneumonia, but commonly in the chart where uh, the role of each loba is not really well demarcated because the line is very is still small. So most of the pneumonia occurs is the bronchopneumonia. So you can actually differentiate the etiology, but from the etiology itself, you cannot actually um, differentiate whether okay, patient uh, datang reset, patient me, but oh, this is fungal. So the clinical manifestation not usually can tell you whether this is viral, bacteria, or fungal, but usually the viral one is becoming it less severe compared to the bacterial one. Uh, or how is it required, whether it's community acquired pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia, it's important in the sense of the antibiotic that you use. Because most of the hospital acquired pneumonia, they usually uh, have some degree of resistance towards some antibiotics. So that's important in terms of the management. Otherwise, the clinical manifestation can usually cannot be differentiated. Uh, yeah, majority is viral origin, and it's it's good to know what is the type of the bacterial pathogen for the each group because uh, it can help you in the sense of prescribing the antibiotics. Uh, because uh, like if it's like you won't usually use you stick with the uh, penicillin group if it's preschool or school going age usually you can um, give them a broad spectrum or um, the, the macrolides uh, to cover the atypical uh, organism okay so this is some other organism that can cause pneumonia. This is just a clinical manifestation for new needs, young infant or older infant in or children. So in new needs, usually they have may have fever, but uh, very subtle. But usually, um, feeding could be very difficult. They will have uh, reduced. Uh, appetite, they did not want to breastfeed in. Okay, for young infant, uh, they can be apnea, but the manifestation of the pneumonia is much more clearer in older or older infant or children. So, because they can simply complain and we can see them clinically less active, the parents easily see the changes for them because usually they are very, very playful and they're active. So when they have pneumonia, usually they, it's it's obvious for the parents to catch up the symptoms. So this is like what I said earlier. So viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, or atypical pneumonia. We can have these features, but you can have uh viral pneumonia with a high fever as well you can have like low grade fever but it's actually a bacterial pneumonia okay so this is just physical examination like i said earlier um, whether it's asthma whether it's pneumonia or whether it's bronchiolitis your physical examination is basically you need to to know what you see and to know what you are looking for. 
this is tech tachymnia, but actually the respiratory rate is differ from month to month, but you can actually refer to pediatric protocol. So chest x-ray, uh, chest x-ray is not always necessary. It's when patient is not, uh, it's when patient is uh, desaturating, not improving with your empirical antibiotics, only then you can actually uh, may suggest to do chest x-ray. Otherwise, it's not necessarily to expose a small child with radiation. Um, however, if you do chest x-ray, you don't actually can differ from if it's a viral or it's is this bacteria or it's a fungal cause of pneumonia. So this is a complication of the pneumonia, which is you develop empyema on the right side, which is you have accumulation of the pus in the uh, right lung cavity. Some of the some of the investigation can be done. Uh, you, for example, you can do FBC. This is common for you to to see leukopenia or leukocytosis, or even look on the, on the hemoglobin level. So you can do blood culture, but to do blood culture in smaller children, it's going to be a bit um, challenging because blood culture and sensitivity require a sep aseptic uh, technique, but it's very difficult when your patient cannot do it young, grad -grad, so so, and some other things that you do is pluripotent analysis and serological testing. But usually, this is because uh, because first, this is in pluripotent analysis is invasive, invasive unless there is a significant plural effusion that you need to uh, do plural testing. Only then you send for pure analysis. So management of this uh, pneumonia is uh, differentiated by the severity. So you have to classify the severity of pneumonia, whether it's uh, mild, severe, or very severe. But in the patient less than two months, there is no mild pneumonia. Anything that pneumonia is, we consider them as a severe pneumonia. So they have to be treated uh, in patient. So what you can do is home and always monitor the oxygen the population of the patient because it's not like um, uh, an adult when you have to do something, you don't need to uh, experience to like four hours, six hours, or six days. So like the first time you have to monitor, you have to put them in the way. Equipment so for close observation, so and, and you have to you you have to really monitor them well because it is really so these are three criteria for hospitalization. So you have a patient less than or equal to three months, like the previous month, less than two months, less than three months. They have to be hospitalized. So fever is on five visit to fit to meet people and a part of the hospital for fast breathing with with or without sinuses, a chemical failure of previous antibiotic therapy, recurrent pneumonia with or severe underlying disorder, for example, HIV or malnourished child. Okay, so for failure of previous antibiotic therapy means like when the patient have been treated at home, and for example, you already give like uh, syrup, uh, amoxicillin, for example, syrup or syrup, um, cephalexin, for example. You give, give them syrup, cephalexin for five days. And they came in again with still have a kidney fever 38 and still having complaint of not getting well. So you need to hospitalize them. So this patient maybe requires some uh, 
are this antibiotic and maybe need to be septic will come but we actually to to really recognize what is the causative organism for this pneumonia so the antibiotic therapy so for the most of most of the most of the causative organism especially the bacteria uh, the penicillin group is good enough so whether it's streptococcus hemophilus staphylococcus or group is streptococcus uh, usual penicillin groups are usually enough and sometimes we usually use the second group, uh, second generation capsulosporin, like epilepsin. Or if not, or if not, you can try with the broad spectrum antibiotic. Usually, we give augmentin, the amoxicillin, epilepsin acid. Or else, uh, the atypical one, we can give them metrolytes. So this is important because. The causative organism usually differ from the age group. So if they are school going age, you might want to uh, prescribe them with macrolides in instead of the, the penicillin group. So for example, you want to give erythromycin, clarithromycin, or azithromycin as well. So this is some antibiotic that even into very severe and severe pneumonia tissue. Uh, for example, you give B penicillin, uh, you can give amoxicillin and clavulinate, which is the augmenting. Second line, we have the cephalosporin, the second, the third and fourth generation, so for cephalosporin and cephalosporin. And the third line and the other agent is used for when you do the culture and sensitivity, it came back as, it came back as a drug resistant, so you, you should use either for example the carbapenem group the imipenem or other agent for example gentamicin and nicotine but very uh, important for you to if you use aminoglycoside it's very important for you to send uh, therapeutic drug monitoring because it's have autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity to the patient so you need to uh, monitor the the dose level in the blood. So otherwise, uh, the supportive treatment is just a supportive treatment. Uh, you have to give treats, but bear in mind not to over hydrating the patient uh, because you might cause uh, pulmonary edema as well and making patient uh, really hard to breathe. You can give you you should give oxygen. Cough medication is not really uh, not really helpful because some cough medication they suppress the cough. So if the cough is suppressed and some of the medication cough medication is antihistamine and it causes drowsiness. So it will make you confused in the sense of your clinical clinical evaluation whether this patient is drowsy because the disease itself or whether the the this the patient is drowsy because the syrup benadryl that you give earlier so it's better not to give especially in patient do not give any syrup benadryl or or what is it called or antihistamine cough medication because your patient will be drowsy temperature control same as well only if the temperature is more than 38 or very high, 38.5, you can give uh, sub uh, suppository uh, paracetamol or PCM. Because if not, you will not know whether your treatment is working or not because the temperature is normal temperature, but the patient is on paracetamol. So it, it it's actually uh, will not helpful your clinical evaluation because you you did not know whether your antibiotic is working or the patient they, they didn't have temperature because it's just your PCM that you've been given. So it's very important. Only give if it's really, really needed. So you can actually call or refer for chest PCP therapy because um, 
the child, the young child, usually they don't have like uh, their, their excretion of their mucus is not really good as the, the adult one. So you need to assist them by few techniques of chest uh, tapping to actually release the mucus and help the mucus to be excreted into the uh, GI system. Otherwise, if the patient is uh, can be discharged, you can oralize the antibiotic. For example, if the patient on cephalosporin, IV, or IV penicillin, you can change it into either form, which is syrup. It can be given as a syrup. Lah. For example, syrup, as I mentioned earlier, syrup it can be syrup of maintain, syrup, uh, you know, other kind of uh, antibiotic syrup. So you have to educate that. Uh, to the patient, uh, to educate the parents and the caregiver that because in any time, even patient looks stable, uh, the patient can actually deteriorate, deteriorate again and again. So you need to know, you need to ask, you need to teach the parents how to assess uh, the, the patient, the clinical symptom of the patient. And this child should actually you you should actually send the patient to KK that you discharge about two three days to be reassessed at the KK. Maybe take some blood blood count and see the improvement of the antibiotic. If it's not improved, the patient can be admitted or can uh, have to change to another course of antibiotic. Well, I guess that's all. Uh, it's really a long topic. Uh, because we need to cover all respiratory disease in uh, one day, in one hour and a half. So, but worry not, this is just a few slides that I believe you have gone through and you have learned from your previous posting or your current posting if you're in pediatrics. So if you have any question, you can ask. Yeah, ada ke? Ada question ke? Nak tanya ya? Tapi if you have a good question or any question, I guess uh, nanti you can discuss with your uh, senior ke, your ataupun dekat awal jumpa your MO ke, pediatrician uh, you can, you should ask them because uh, like I said earlier, I've been about almost one year not, not in the school so I might forget a lot of things. So apa pun nanti korang tanya your 